Arthi Prabhakar, the director of, the, of DARPA, we're here to talk about the future of war, and if you're talking about the future, you're talking about DARPA when you cover the Pentagon. I'll be very brief about her remarkable record because you can read all about it, uh, other than to say a uh, couple of highlights. President Clinton appointed her director of the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which I think everyone in this room would understand is a fundamental building block of national security in this country, uh, besides the other things it does do. Uh, she served in many uh, venture, private sector venture capacities in Silicon Valley. And uh, when I look at her CV, the thing that she knows always impresses me the most is uh, she has a doctorate of philosophy in applied physics from Caltech, which is pretty darn cool. <laughs> but I think you once said it was just the name of the degree. That's what they give you that there. That is what you get when you get it. That's, that's, that's what happens. Um, so it, it seems to me that when we want to look at the future of military technology and what role it plays in future warfare, we do talk about the notion that the future is already here. And your agency must be in a fascinating position right now because you, you spend billions on advanced research, but yet we are in this era of ISIS, of fighting what essentially is an adversary that perhaps exhibits traits of uh, thinking of the 8th century, though I suspect there was a lot more humanity in the 8th century than these people have. Um, and yet they do have some very advanced capabilities in social media. So, so talk to us about that. ISIS is going low tech, except for social media, while the Pentagon still focuses on high tech. Information, that, information warfare. That's a great place to start. Let me just say, first of all, I, I'm really glad to be here because I think this conference is asking these very challenging questions about how the world is changing and how technology is changing. Uh, I really uh, applaud that focus and appreciate the chance to participate. So there's an 8th century component in ISIS and there's a 21st century component with their use of social media. And I, I, I love the way you frame the question because the 8th century part of it is horrific, but it's actually their 21st century tools that are the scalable part. And I, you know, in many regards, I think that's the piece that is, um, needs addressing in order to deal with the whole situation. And in fact, I think we're beginning now to have tools and techniques to start dealing with that. Um, if you think about it, ISIS in essence is using the same infrastructure that we use for perfect, you know, for all the good things that the internet has brought us in terms of connectivity, commerce, changing the way we interact with family and community. They're using that for their nefarious purposes. Uh, today at DARPA, just as an example, we are developing some of the tools and technologies that allow us to start seeing patterns of interconnection in that vastness of the internet. Uh, a program, for example, that we've been working on called Memex started by developing uh, a way to understand linkages among websites, first in the, in the domain of trying to look for sex trafficking. And in fact, that early work very rapidly led to the ability to see, um, for example, sa the same phone numbers that would pop up over and over again in websites. And it started, we started very quickly being able to give law enforcement, in that case, a tool that allowed them rather than doing a single threaded search through just the small portion of the web that is indexed by Google or Bing, now we've given them a tool to do domain-specific deep web search. That's what Memex is all about. In the human trafficking world, that is now leading to indictments and convictions. Very satisfying to see. But those tools, of course, can be used for many other purposes, and today we're starting now to help with the fight uh, against ISIS using those same kinds of tools. Well, One what, example. It's fantastic. Well, I think everybody probably has exactly the same question I have. What can you do? What do you, what's the payoff here? Where are you going with this program in terms of ISIS? Yeah, I, and uh, you know, that work is just beginning, and I think uh, because it's live and we're in, in a wartime situation, we're not, that, that's not going to be an area that we can talk about in a lot of detail. But if you look at what, how it played out in the case of law enforcement and human trafficking, um, I, maybe just to use that as an example, there what we found was that by looking in a particular region, we started working with law enforcement in the Dallas, Texas region, they were looking for sex trafficking patterns and networks. 
we looked at back page ads in uh, the Dallas, Texas region, and from that we were able to build a very quick assessment of where the same phone numbers kept showing up on multiple websites. You know, again, if you're looking across thousands and thousands manually, you wouldn't have seen it, but we were able to scoop up these high value phone numbers, hand them to law enforcement, uh, and then our law enforcement colleagues, from they were sort of taken aback, I think, initially by how rich that data set was. Many of those numbers tied to uh, criminal violations that they already knew about through conventional law enforcement means. More interesting, from a national security point of view, they found that some of those phone numbers linked to fund transfers in the region around North Korea, and that started them on the trail of looking for a, a trafficking network. So um, it, that's the kind of work that is now being picked up by law enforcement and is starting to help put people behind bars for human trafficking and sex trafficking. But you can imagine how that might give you a way to see how, how the ISIS global community that's spreading like this cancer, how are they using that infrastructure similarly? So everyone talks about information warfare, inf dominance in the information space. What are DARPA's priorities right now? What are you looking for? from industry, from universities? What are the leading edge multipliers that you, you want to see? That, that, that's what we think about all the time. We, we are looking for ways to scale our cybersecurity capabilities faster than the growth of information and the growth of the threat that comes with it. That's, we're looking for foundationally better ideas than patch and pray, which is pretty much all we have today in cybersecurity. And then similarly, in the big data realm, we are looking to, for the, we're, we're, our aim is to build the kinds of tools that will enable end users to deal with that vastness of data, with this huge data explosion. So rather than drowning in it, can we actually start seeing these kinds of very valuable patterns? So cybersecurity and big data, those are the two major objectives, but it, it really, Unlike operational units, our job is to find techniques and tools that are going to scale faster than the explosions happening. And that are, I, I know you've talked about it before, techniques, tools that are useful to a soldier or marine or sailor out to in the, the field. To the end user, Not absolutely. just cool stuff to have cool stuff. Right, we're a technology agency, so we want to show capabilities that are possible and start getting them out into the world, absolutely. Tell us what Plan X is. Plan X is a program uh, designed to give anyone dealing with the cyber world uh, a way to understand what's happening in, the cyber, in cyberspace and to be able to run exercises and to plan maneuvers, uh, whether it's for cybersecurity or for cyber warfare uh, activities. Uh, part, I think part of what makes cyber a very challenging arena is that it is, it is inherently abstract and we struggle to map it to the physical domains that we understand, Plan X starts giving uh, anyone who's involved in that a way to grapple with it. So one example is work that we're doing that will transition, we believe, to the Army, uh, that will actually give soldiers, as uh, you know, on a foot patrol or part of a squad as they're going through a community, uh, give them the, a way to visualize what's happening in the local cyber environment, to understand which Wi-Fi uh, spots they're walking by, to connect, you know, maybe they're going to walk through an urban environment in which they sense a particular Wi-Fi uh, node. Uh, in, they're in a peacekeeping setting. They're trying to make sure that they eliminate bad actors or people who've been involved in IEDs. They know that that Wi-Fi uh, node has been u implicated in a prior act, uh, act of violence against uh, U.S. troops. We want to give them the way to see the local cyber environment. And then all the way on the other end of the spectrum, for uh, at the command level, as you're trying to understand a, a major military operation, again, seeing the cyber environment, being able to assess who's coming at you, how to respond, and, that doesn't and exist, plan. That doesn't exist today. No, it does not exist today. We, it, we, have, um, a, a, we have very highly trained, highly expert cyber warriors uh, who are navigating in this, in this dark, complex space. We want to start, again, making it tools that can be used by, in this case, warfighters at all, at all levels. It sounds to me also like that could be something that achieves another one of your goals, perhaps, of transitioning it to private industry, to companies. That is I won't say Sony Pictures. <laughs> but, well, but this is a really key point. But they might have known. Sometimes, actually, I'd say for a significant part of our portfolio, 
the best way to make the impact that we seek on national security, that's our mission, is to make sure that the technology gets adopted by the commercial sector, either because we need to achieve cybersecurity through our economy in order to protect our nation, uh, or because the commercialization of technologies, robotics is a great example, uh, but there are many, that that commercialization is going to be absolutely necessary before the technology becomes ripe enough for DOD to use for military needs. So at a time, and we're going to start thinking about some questions, because in about five or six minutes, we're going to turn it over to you guys for some questions. You, you, you know, we, we started off the 8th century enemy that's also using 21st century technology, holding, you know, forcing us to hold two, as you say, to hold two ideas in our head at the same time. But still, a Pentagon, a Defense Department spending billions on very high-tech, very complex, single-generation weapons like an F-35. So what's going on? Right. So, so what's I, up with that? <laughs> I, I think what's up with that, the starting point is to really understand the national security environment that we're dealing in today. And you know, my first tour at DARPA was in the Cold War, and, and at that time, the model was you understood, you worked against this one monolithic um, existential threat, and everything else was just sort of backseat, and you didn't really think about it too much. We don't really have the luxury of just dealing with one kind of national security threat today. So ISIS is a today issue. Ebola was you know, a very current issue. Those kinds of crises are going to flare up and be part of the national security environment. I, you know, I, I, I wish I could imagine a time when that weren't going to be true, but I think we're going to need to be dealing with that throughout my lifetime and probably my kids' lifetimes. Those chronic threats and how we deal with them as technology changes what, what those kinds of actors are able to do, that's part of the national security landscape. But it's not the whole story because we know as well that nation states around the world are changing uh, their military positions, their military capabilities, and uh, with those shifts come also the concern about an acute national security threat in the future that we want to deter and, and, and defeat if that becomes necessary. So I, the, the challenge for the department I see is, is you know, really this very wide spectrum of threats. Now the question about how you deal with a peer adversary in the future, how you deter uh, those kinds of conflicts, uh, that is going to need very sophisticated high-end technology, but you are absolutely right. If we do those as point solutions, uh, the equation's just not going to solve. And so at DARPA, what we think about is how do we do, how do we prepare for that environment? How do we get ourselves to a place where we are able to deter and defeat if necessary against a very uh, technologically enabled peer adversary? But how do we do it in a way that isn't just more of the same from the past? And, and you'll see those kinds of ideas about rethinking complex military systems throughout our portfolio as so well. So you're not ready to write off Russia? It's hard to write off Russia given what's been going on. Well, lately. in terms of technology, you know, there's yes. still people readily say, oh, they're just out there using the same stuff they've had for decades. Yeah. Well, I, I think we see old technologies blended with new methods. I, you know, I, it, the, the creativity exhibited by uh, different kinds of threats around the world is not limited to ISIS, right? <laughs> it's, we're seeing it in lots of different places. Let me shift gears for just the last couple of things before we turn it over to the, to the audience. Um, you do some fascinating work in, in the biology area. I know you've worked on advanced prosthetics for wounded warriors. I'd like you to talk about that for a minute. And some of the work you're doing in really leading edge advanced vaccine research. Yeah, maybe I'll start with that. Um, you know, infectious disease to me is, is in this category of chronic crises that are, will, will continue to flare up. And we've just, you know, we hope we're just coming through this last round with Ebola, uh, but we shouldn't relax because I think, you know, our future is gonna have those kinds of challenges. The objective of the DARPA program in this area uh, is to completely collapse the amount of time that it takes for us to contain that kind of a flare up of a new infectious disease. Uh, if you think about what happened with H1N1 a few years ago or Ebola today, uh, the, the peak of infections uh, preceded the time that an effective vaccine was available. So in the case of H1N1, we had this huge surge of H1N1 cases in the United States. Shortly after it started turning over naturally, we actually had you know, a technological solution. 
So our program is, is, aims to collapse that time and nip these infections in the bud. Uh, that takes a number of advances, some on the diagnostic side, which we're pursuing, some in terms of better acting uh, vaccines. But there's a new element that we're introducing, which has to do with the notion of building a fire break, a way to provide immediate protection if anyone who's had a vaccine remembers that there's a period of time, usually weeks, before it becomes effective. So this firebreak notion is a therapy that would provide immediate but temporary protection. And so if you can imagine a case where as infection spreads, we would be able to identify the friends and the hospital workers who are in touch with an infected population, uh, give them this short-term uh, a therapy, creating a fire break, and that allows then time to give a vaccine to a broader population. And, and together then we think all of that can be a way, not just to sort of pull in the timelines, you know, a week or two, but just collapse that timeline and try to nip these things in the bud. Doing that is gonna require amazing advances in biology. It's, in, in a lot of ways, I think it's the positive side of a lot of the synthetic biology conversation that was happening here you know, two sessions ago, uh, because th this is the kind of thing that, that our ability to engineer biology is letting us approach now. And on prosthetics? Prosthetics, so a lot of our work in understanding the human brain began out of a driver uh, centered on restoring uh, function. It began with one of our amazing program managers coming, he was an army doctor, he came back from theater, convinced that we had to find a better upper limb prosthetic for our wounded warriors. Uh, he, he developed this very sophisticated prosthetic arm uh, with many more degrees of freedom than the simple hook that we've had for, for decades. Uh, but he's also a neurointensivist and a neuroscientist, so he also did the research that understood, that came to understand a lot more about neural signaling from the motor cortex. That work, those two branches of that program came together a couple of years ago when we had our first few hum human trials. Uh, one example is a woman named Jan who uh, had been a quadriplegic for a number of years, volunteered to have surgery to place uh, two small uh, uh, probes on the surface of her brain, on the motor cortex. Those uh, signals then, her neural signals are directly picked up and, and now we're, she was very rap sort of surprisingly rapidly, she was able to, to just think and directly control this very sophisticated prosthetic arm. So uh, the, she, she thinks she can shake your hand or offer you a stack of cookies, sort of amazing functionality for someone who's been paralyzed for this time. And uh, it, it's so moving to see what an impact it has on people to be able to even experiment with a technology like that from the perspective of restoration. But of course, in doing that work, we've also opened this door to, it, we can now see a future where we can free the brain from the limitations of the human body. And we all, you know, I think we can all imagine amazing, amazing good things and amazing potentially bad things that are on the other give side of that right, door. You, <laughs> give us a couple of examples on both sides. Well, so, uh, you know, Jan uh, tolerated her implants very well and we were able to extend her period of time with that, so we started experimenting. Jan's initially, the, impl the implants she had are on the, her left motor cortex designed to operate a right arm, as, as you learn in your neuroscience, you know, 101. Um, uh, Johns Hopkins uh, uh, Applied Physics Lab built the arm. They, they built a left arm as well. So we said, well, let's see if, what happens if Jan tries to control two arms from the part of her brain that's only supposed to control one arm. Well, it looks like Jan has, surprisingly, she has some fu independent functionality of both arms from this one spot. Then Jan decided that she wanted to try flying um, a Joint Strike Fighter simulator. So. Jan got to fly in the simulator, and Jan, um, in, instead of thinking about controlling a joystick, which is what our, you know, our ace pilots do, right, when they're driving this thing, oh. Jan's thinking about controlling the airplane directly. And in fact, you know, for someone who's never flown, she's not a pilot in real life, she's in there flying that simulator directly from, from her neural her, signaling. From her so you can start to see some things. Maybe that, a few years before the Air Force does that. <laughs> uh, I, I think we're a long way from any of those becoming real, but again, we've but opened this they, door. Yeah. Those are, you can see some amazing positive things, but, yeah. but of course, you know, we're talking about crossing some very important ethical boundaries when you start talking about people being able to do 
this very different way of connecting their brains to the rest of the world. So we think it's an important time to think about what those next steps in research are going to be to engage a bigger community. Um, but I think this is, maybe I should just take a minute and say, I, in this area, in privacy issues regarding data, in, in the synthetic biology area, over and over again we find, because of our mission, which is to pursue these frontiers for national security, we frequently find that we are pushing into new areas of technology that we know are going to raise very important issues of ethics, societal, morality, ethical questions, social right. issues. And uh, we believe our job is twofold. Number one, our, our core mission is to understand and pursue and, and grapple with these technologies for our country and to understand what the possibilities are before anyone else does. That, that is a core function and a core role for us in the context of national security. So we, we don't want to only go play in the safe places. That would be a violation of our mission. But with this pursuit of these advanced technologies comes a deep responsibility not to craft the answers for society, because I don't want to live in a society where a bunch of technologists and national security tell you the answers to those questions. But I, I think it's so vital that we engage, and we are engaging in, in each of those areas with a broader community of people who can help us think about how we might approach research, but also to whom we can show this future that technology is making possible so that they can be part of helping us, helping us, the large us, the societal us, think about where, where this can go. So I, I wanted to mention that because I think it's very much in keeping with the theme of this conference. The and I, I think it's very constructive. I am quite certain that there must be some questions out there. And I don't know how we're doing this. Are there microphones in the room? All right, so. And of course, obviously, please say your name so Dr. Prabhakar knows who she's talking to. Uh, Joe Marks from Politico. Uh, in the uh, DARPA budget request for fiscal 16, there seems to be a shift in cyber priorities from a, a little bit less of a focus on things like Plan X, uh, combating cyber attacks, and more on uh, surviving through cyber attacks, which you also hear about elsewhere in DOD. And I was wondering if you could talk about that, things like uh, Edge CT, I think it's called, and, and those programs. Yeah, when you look at, at DARPA's budget uh, as it's submitted through the president's budget, uh, what, what I think you're seeing is a very natural consequence of the fact that we're a projects agency. And so at any moment in time at DARPA, some projects are wrapping up and winding down and others are starting up. The, the two examples you gave are both within a larger and much longer scale commitment to this transformative thinking in cybersecurity uh, that I described. Uh, but yeah, Plan X started a few years ago, so its budget is, it, it, I, I don't actually remember exactly what the numbers are. You probably know better than I do since you just looked at it. Uh, and then we are doing some work uh, starting up now on exactly this idea of how do you operate through and then survive and, and reconstruct after uh, a devastating attack. We'll have you continue to, that gentleman back there perhaps. And then we'll move over to the left side of the room. <clears throat> uh, thank you for that presentation. Um, I'm Nicholas Berry from Foreign Policy Forum. When our website uh, writes critically about, especially two governments, uh, our computers are attacked and even our server gets attacked and shut down. Um, we have re geeks on retainer. <laughs> um, there's not much we can do about that, is there? Well, uh, I think this is, you know, I don't know your specific story, but the frustration that you are expressing is that is the cybersecurity realm that we live in today. And uh, Barbara, you mentioned Sony, but yeah, I mean, everyone is dealing with these con just c continuing attacks. Our sites are co constantly under attack. You see it as well. And today, I think the best, the, the best answer I have for anyone that's dealing with that is get up to date, do patch and pray, because th that is the best you can do, but at least let's do that. And actually, it's sort of alarming when you look at cyber attacks, how frequently you find that, in fact, things weren't patched, things, things weren't updated. So there is actual value in just staying as current as you possibly can. 
Uh, but again, I think you know, over time we want to develop some tools that will get us a little bit better foundation of cybersecurity. Let me just give you one example. Uh, we have a new uh, DARPA challenge that's underway today. It's called the Cyber Grand Challenge. And the notion there is that uh, you know, if you go to DEF CON every year, there's a capture the flag for human teams to compete uh, to try to keep their networks up and deliver on their missions while they're all attacking each other and fighting off attacks. Uh, and these amazing, uh, amazingly capable teams fight for this honor every year. We're building a league of their own for machines to, do, to play capture the flag because we want to start developing the automated systems for cybersecurity uh, in the hope that they, I think, uh, the expectation that they will be able to scale uh, and to operate at machine speed, which is what's going to be necessary given that the attacks are coming at machine speed. You know, if you think about the attacks that are, that are being driven at machine speed and you think about humans typing as fast and furiously as they can, you know, that's, you know we're just dead, right? So we're going to have to find a way to get machines to scale and, and keep up with that. So I think the Cyber Grand Challenge over time is going to lead to the kinds of tools that I hope will, you know, make your pain go away. So how many people in this room have either had their email, their Twitter, their social media? How many people have been hacked and makes... I can't be the only one. Oh, Come on. Everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Have you ha have you had yours hacked? Oh, a few months ago, the entire Pentagon press corps got hacked oh, by the nice. same okay. by the same visitor. You were all loved <laughs> equally. Okay. That's right. I think we had a question back here. A gentleman. Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Tom Risen. I'm the technology reporter at U.S. News and World Report. Uh, thanks for all the great work you do at DARPA. I love robots and. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, you mentioned ethics, and you also mentioned autonomous um, capability. Um, how are you tackling the ability? Um, there's talk of uh, drones or cybersecurity programs that can make some of their own decisions so that they can tackle threats faster than a human operator. But you also mentioned a process for ethics. How are you dealing with the ethics of that? Because a drone could... It has missiles attached to it, and it could make some of its own decisions. So that's obviously a future ethics concern. How are you thinking about that? I think this issue of um, autonomy and how we want to use it, use those advanced capabilities, is core. And as you point out, it really does span across many, many different uh, domains and types of technologies. Uh, the way we're trying to think about this and grapple with it is to start by thinking not just about what the machines do, but about how humans and machines accomplish tasks together. Um, and if you think about it that way, I think, let me break the term autonomy down. One dimension of it is uh, the, the technical capabilities of systems. And in fact, because of all the te underlying technologies, we know that those continue to get better. The second part of the equation is the autonomy piece, which is really about rules of engagement. Those are human choices in the context of warfighting. They're warfighter choices about what, what degree of technological capability is used under what circumstances. And um, you know, especially when you get to practical warfighting situations, I, I, I see a lot of warfighters and future warfighters in the room. My experience is that those are, those are the people who are the least interested in losing control over the decision-making process, because that is the central responsibility of our warfighters in, in conflict. Um, so again, if, if we try to frame it in terms of understanding the advance of technological capability and thinking through where the human decision-making and control uh, fits into how those technologies are used. So for example, Cyber Grand Challenge, if that leads to autonomous cyber defense capabilities, there's still going to be a human decision about what class of behavior it's going to be used against and what machines it's deployed on. Uh, and I think that generalizes to things like the use of uh, higher technological capability uh, in weapon systems as well. So human decision always somewhere in the chain. There's, all, uh, there's always a human, I mean, I, fundamentally that's, conflict is about those human decisions and, and more, over many generations we have increased the technological capability that humans control and decide and I think that will continue but I think you just want to keep your eye on the ball that it is where about that, humans. Where it is in that. that. Yeah. Right. Some more questions please. Uh, this gentleman right here and then the gentleman in the back by the door please. Thank you again. Uh, 
appreciate your work. I'm the deputy, sec deputy at the uh, Cyber Center at the Naval Academy, and one of the big issues we're talking about is the intersection of unmanned systems and cyber insecurity. And one of the arguments made was, well, if we have a cyber attack on uh, advanced military, then we can go full auto, and we don't have to worry about the downlink, uh, which point then brings up the ethical questions of what the machine will do. But it was interesting, I was talking with uh, former Secretary of the Navy, Danzig, who's written a recent paper on this, and he isn't, doesn't seem to be so sure about the supply chain, because people argued, well, these unmanned systems will have a secure supply chain, we'll know everything that's in there. And he made an observation that the number of basically transistors being built per second in, in the world today is in the trillions per second. And can we really even know what's going into these many, many components? So I wonder if you could comment on, might cyber insecurity trump or delay this move to autonomy in unmanned or paired systems? Yeah, I think there are um, a handful of very interesting topics embedded in the, the comments you made. Let me, let me just uh, tease out a couple. One is about the supply chain. Uh, we live today in a world in which um, I, I actually think that the, the DOD use of semiconductor components, we've, we've put ourselves on a dead end path. Um, and today we use a technology base that is American, it's uh, IBM, but it's in a semiconductor fabrication facility that IBM is in the process of trying to sell to a company that is still located in the United States but is owned by Abu Dhabi. And so I think this, the whole model on which our notion has been based for the control of the supply chain for the semiconductor components, which often are the critical pieces here, uh, all of that I think is, um, is gonna get swept away. I mean, something different is gonna happen. And I actually think that's a good thing because by, by focusing on trust, we have, we've achieved trust through that model, but we, the price we have paid is that we move much more slowly and we use much, more, much older technology. And I think relative to where commercial industry is, we've been at a disadvantage, therefore we've been at a disadvantage versus uh, adversarial threats. So at DARPA, we think it's a great time to reset on that question of the trusted supply chain for electronics. We're working on some radically new approaches to that problem that will allow us to get to use the leading edge capability that is a fundamentally global technology that is not controlled by the United States anymore. But it, we want to tap that and we want to end up with trusted systems and we're working on a new paradigm to achieve that, number one. And then number two, I think this notion of um, the cyber dimension of security for embedded systems uh, is, that's a major issue for DOD. Uh, but it is also, as we talk about what's happening commercially with the Internet of Things, uh, all of that, you know, when, when I hear Internet of Things, I think the marketers are all imagining all these wonderful gadgets. What I see is this exploding attack surface, and I think it's going to be a pretty unpleasant experience unless we figure out how to make um, those embedded systems secure. But uh, there, I, I think there's actually some very good progress on a DARPA program in that area. It's a program called Hackums. It takes formal methods uh, and starts scaling them so that operating systems for embedded platforms can be made provably correct for specified security properties. And we're just starting to demonstrate unhackable small size drones. Some of that is starting to move over into the automotive industry. Again, you know, that's part of that attack surface that, that is available to, to attackers today. So, so again, another piece of this notion of foundational cybersecurity that, uh, that, that elevates our capabilities across the spectrum. I believe there's a gentleman way in the back and then the gentleman standing up. Let's see if we can get both of you in. And then the gentleman sitting right in front of him when this gentleman's done. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, ben Hernandez. So for decades, the military has been able to plan around space as a sanctuary for our intelligence and communications, which I imagine our near peer competitors are not too happy about. Are there threats emerging to our space capabilities and how is DARPA meeting those challenges? Yeah, space, I'm really glad you asked about space because it's, it, that's another domain that has changed dramatically. Uh, I, I think we still, uh, our methodologies and the way that we uh, deal with the space domain today are still sort of premised on an environment in which we were the only ones acting up there. And of course, two things have happened. One is that other nation states are getting active on orbit. Uh, the other is that commercial space has just exploded in a really terrific way. And so, you know, so it's, it's no longer just the sort of uh, sparsely uh, occupied uh, uh, part of the 
not part of the world, but around the world, um, that, that we can just sort of hang out in and do whatever we want. So a number of things need to change uh, for us to be able to maintain uh, the, the incredibly critical uh, space assets that we need for every aspect of war fighting. Um, the, I mean, unfortunately, there's not going to be a simple answer to this, but the solution, I believe, lies in everything from real-time space domain awareness to changing what's possible on orbit and changing the cost structure of what we do on orbit, uh, but also changing launch. And just to use that as, as maybe one example, uh, one of the things that I think is promising in space is especially in the commercial space world, we're starting to see amazing things possible on very small satellites driven by microelectronics and software. Uh, but those, even those small sats today still rely on you know, launching out of Canaveral or, or um, uh, Vandenberg. You, you, you still sort of have this 24-hour delay, 24-month delay before you can actually get on, uh, on orbit. We want to break that, and one of our programs, ALASA, uh, is designed to let a fighter aircraft uh, take uh, a, a rocket with a satellite up uh, to a high enough elevation that it can then boost from, uh, from that uh, high elevation to low Earth orbit and uh, net of all of that, deploy a satellite in 24 hours from the time you're ready to go, uh, do it for a million dollars for 100 pounds to LEO and do it from any runway in the world, which I think would be game changing uh, for space but just one of the things we're gonna to need to be able to answer your question. And let's for make it our last question as we wrap up. The gentleman in the back there, please. Hi, Zach Biggs with Janes. Um, I wanted to ask you about risk. Uh, in particular, DARP is known for taking some greater risk. It's part of the purpose of the agency. Um, Pentagon official Al Schaefer has talked about his desire to get more risk in the research and development pro uh, programs for a lot of the service labs, for a lot of different areas in the Pentagon. He also said that if those labs didn't start doing it, he would think there'd be more money going to DARPA. Obviously, more money would be great for the agency, but oh. do, do you envision that there's a way to try to get more of those labs taking some of the risks that might be necessary for the Leap Ahead technology that's, for instance, being talked about as part of the Long Range Research and Development Planning Program? You know, the reason we talk about risk is not because we love risk. We take risk because it is necessary to achieve high impact, and, and that's really what we need to be talking about. In fact, a conversation I have with my program managers all the time is, uh, you know, if you can achieve very high impact with zero risk, let's just go do that. But it turns out after you do those, there aren't too many of those, and, and after you do those, then you have to take risk if you want to reach for really transformative change and future opportunities. Um, in the context of the broader S&T community in the Defense Department, I think it's important to be clear about missions. DARPA was created in the wake of Sputnik out of a recognition that the, the science and tech base that we were building in the Army, Navy, and the Air Force was incredibly essential, but that we also needed a place that daily came into work to think about how to prevent that kind of technological surprise by living outside of the known requirements and, and the visible threats and opportunities. And that, that, is, um, very, that, that, that is still you know, how our roles and responsibilities are divided up all these decades later. And I think it's really important that we not lose sight of that um, because, in fact, you don't want all of S&T doing what DARPA does. You need a lot of what the service uh, S&T organizations do. Without that work, we don't realize a lot of these uh, advanced capabilities. We certainly don't keep up with uh, all the daily needs that uh, our, our big complex mission systems have. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm always about let's reach for greater impact, but I, you don't want to make everyone look the same. You need an entire ecosystem that works. And uh, it, in fact, DARPA can't achieve what we need if that, the rest of that ecosystem isn't functional. So uh, I, I think it's important to understand it in that context. Well, we're just about out of time. I have to tell you, Arthur, if, if, uh, if half the things you've sketched out here came to be true, it would be not just a different world, but it would be a different Pentagon press corps we'd be covering. <laughs> we'd be covering a different world. She's given me about six things to think about, which I just have to beat Politico on deadline, <laughs> which is not easy to do. They're faster than me. Um, it's all about pace in my world, it, it too. Is, what can I tell it you? Is. It is. It's, um, it's about innovation. It's about speed. And maybe someday we'll have a pilot take us, think about taking, he'll, he or she, We'll take a plane into space, launch a satellite completely with their mind, 
and not, <laughs> and there'll be no hands-on controls. Um, thank you. Is there anything, we have two seconds left, but let me just ask you, I think we all want to know. Is there anything we haven't asked you about? Is there like some incredibly, oh, there's so much. Even, more super, <laughs> even more super cool thing that DARPA's doing? that we can't even imagine? Is there like one last? One last thing. One last piece of super cool stuff? Uh, well, there? if you want cool, we could talk about cold atoms. I'll just finish with cold atoms. So we're completely dependent on GPS for position navigation and timing today. Um, we know that that's not a good strategy to have a point dependence. And so among uh, many things that we're doing to get beyond that GPS dependence is we're taking this beautiful cold atom physics and starting to make uh, the world's most accurate clocks and uh, gyroscopes, uh, not you know on big lab benches with PhDs, but in boxes that you can put onto ships and um, take this Nobel Prize winning physics from 20 years ago and turn it into solutions to DOD problems. Is that going to change the you know super expensive watches out there that we all wish we might uh, think about buying? Uh, I I don't think cold atoms are coming into your watch, but they're, they're get, they are getting smaller, so, so I don't know. I think it would be uncomfortable on your wrist. It's going to be a little bulky. All right, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Barbara.